My name is Scott Challoner and you are listening to the Leaders' Council podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. Part of our mission here at the Leaders' Council, as our regular listeners may well know very well, is to bring you a variety of distinct perspectives on leadership and in pursuit of those aims, we're today joined on the programme by Alistair Kerr, founding director of Acre Properties Limited, a property sales and lettings company based over in West London. Um, Alistair, very warm welcome to yourself today and welcome back as well. Um, of course, it's the, uh, the second time that you've recently uh, been on the show. It is. Uh, and uh, morning to you, Scott. Good morning, Alistair. And uh, just sort of linking back to that uh, recent discussion that we uh, that we did have, we talked a little bit about your idea, Operation Mars, and the lender's role in all of that. And the idea, of course, of uh, the Mars plan, just to kind of set the scene for those who maybe didn't tune into the previous episode, is that there are hundreds of thousands of people each year who approach a lender looking to buy a house they have a sound credit history they can evidence months or even years of renting and they're still rejected for a mortgage on account of not having a large enough deposit it doesn't have to be that way does it and the idea is that there's a better way of maybe doing things perhaps but nobody is actually clicking in and recognizing it so just for those that may not know the ins and outs of Operation Mars, Alistair, how would you sort of explain it in sort of very simple terms to begin with? Sure. Uh, I'm certainly not going to compete with Mr. Elon Musk. Um, so this is basically mortgage application referral scheme or system. Mm. Essentially, you go into a lender or online or whatever, and you can show viable um, accounts and information, which often the lender will say, well, you can afford it. Mm. And uh, you'll see in the article in 2000, I think it was 19, person I knew very well, great credit history. His savings each month exceeded the interest on the targeted loan. Uh, and yet he, he was he, he was basically declined. And he was earning £1,100 and £300 into savings. So my system is, if you go to a lender and you go through it, and essentially there's that affordability, you can see it. The the bank or the lender will be regulated. Now, they can say, we can only do things within certain measures. Now, what I'm suggesting is you have a second opportunity. You go in. In effect, you're rejected. However, the lender can say, if this were on a product of five or more likely, I would say 10 years or longer, and you can show that your rent is more than sufficient to cover the interest on that fixture, and it could be that you'd be prepared to pay in the difference between what you currently pay in rent and what it would be in the mortgage, then we will refer it to this scheme. And the, the scheme itself would be people, hopefully sensibly minded, given some instruction, and see about the affordability with the person being overcommitting, etc. But the bank has to do, or the lender, building society, you name it, has to make sure they know who's sitting in front of them, they've got all the viable information, there's all documentation has been credited. So they are saying, we know this person and there may be a period of time, say 18 months before this person could be lent on that basis. It goes to the, the scheme uh, and the referral agency. They look at it, they can see it. And then the lender is saying, if it were this way, we believe this, this person, this couple could afford it. So at that point, you can either get an acceptance or agreed in principle subject to from the Mars project. And that will satisfy the regulator and the, um, the uh, lenders on the basis that the government have approved that this is seen as safe and sensible. And that's really the basis of what I'm proposing. Exactly right. And um, there's evidence as well um, that basically everybody's going to be covered in this. I mean, it's not necessarily going to cost a great deal to actually set up the uh, the Mars mechanism, is it? Because 
essentially you can just sort of ask the uh, those that are applying for it to sort of put a fee into it and it could operate remotely so it doesn't necessarily need a, a premises so it could very well instantly pay for itself and then there's also um, a mechanism as well to make sure that the regulators don't have any sleepless nights over this yeah well, exactly there, there are four elements obviously there's government there's the lenders there's the regulator or the authority covering uh, the lenders, and the public. And we're specifically looking at first-time borrowers. In London, the Bank of Mum and Dad, otherwise known as the Mad Bank, has to fork out something in the order of £125,000 to assist their offspring obtain a place. It's a huge amount. So if you've got two children, could be, I'm assuming there's going to be equality. That's 250000 probably when someone's in their 50s. This is a lot of money. My scheme doesn't require the bank of mum and dad. It doesn't damage generations. If you can afford it and you can show that you can pay something over a long time, then that's fine. Imagine if someone, say, four or five years renting. They start in their job just now, it's probably 30,000, but say we wind about five years, 30,000. Two years later, maybe they're on 37. Another two years, they're on 43. And something like uh, 48, something like five years, say, say that figure. But you can see a trend. So when someone goes in and says, I would like to be lent, sure, you could say, well, there's a good trend there. We can lend four and a half. But if you are going to be taking the option of a 10-year fixed, or a, more likely a 15-year fixed. This is the rate, and also the rate can be adjusted slightly by the increase in the deposit you are prepared to put down. So you might put in 5%. That's great. And you take an indemnity. That's a policy which you pay a premium for. And the prop premium, I would suggest, covers and maybe 400, 500 pounds. I don't know. It could be added to the mortgage so it doesn't directly hit you. But if you could pay it, it may pay off, say, the first 10% of any um, equity or, or shortfall. Yeah? So that way, the government has, doesn't have to pay for it. The lender doesn't have to pay for it. The regulator knows that there's some protection. And the thing is, if people's income is going down, if you can afford it day one, what do you reckon you might afford in five years down the track? or 15 under normal circumstances. I know my income went over um, when I was working in banking considerably over a 20-year period, which sure most people would. So we could also incentivize people as well. There was a really good scheme, but it was far, far too generous. It was got rid of by the government because it was right. It was crazy before. They used to give you in the 70s, and I think it got abolished near the end of the 80s, called Myris, uh, Mars interest relief at source, mortgage interest relief at source. And sometimes it's working out, you're getting a credit into your account for £80 a month. Great. So how long would it last? You know, the hardest period is usually your first two years. Well, it went a little bit longer than two years. Would it go out to five? Yes. It actually went out to 25 years. It might have even gone out to 30. Now, someone's income could have been very small and gone tenfold or twentyfold and they would just still be getting the 80. So my thoughts are, wouldn't it be good to give someone a competitive 15-year product and say, if you go onto that, the government will allow you a tax credit of so much per month, but it will either taper down at 20% per year or after year five, it vanishes. So the other years could benefit other people but it's basically to get you on to ensure you're okay and in the meantime hopefully you are putting capital repayments on top of the interest so we calculate it on the interest and i would imagine the mars scheme uh, the mars scheme will allow you and or may say it is a requirement that you pay the difference between what you have been paying on your rent into the mortgage so after five years you might pay down 20, 30,000 pounds. Happy days. That's your equity, isn't it? So that's really what I'm proposing. 
Exactly right. And um, there was a little bit of a soft market test that I sort of did personally with some personal uh, family and friends. And people who own homes did suggest as well that a scheme like Mars would have significantly helped them, would have saved them sort of three to five years on actually saving for a house. And there's some prospective first time buyers out there who did feel that it could really, really help them in their bid to, uh, to get on the property ladder as well. And um, it obviously helps the the first time buyer win um it helps the uh, the lender fill out their loan book the government has nothing to worry about the regulator has nothing to worry about uh, but as well as that um surely at a time where we're talking an awful lot about polling performance in the uh, the context of the current climate any government that's going to be proactive in trying to solve what is an incredibly long standing problem it's probably going to be sort of quite conducive to their to their political ambitions as well isn't it I don't think it'll do them any harm. We've come out with a scheme. Well, look, it's kind of my scheme, but uh, it doesn't matter, which we believe will significantly give a number of people a chance of getting on earlier in life. You've talked about three to, I think you said three to five years. Imagine being in a bed sit, waiting to get on, or a, a very small flat, paying rent, when you know that you could have been paying three or five years on a mortgage down that you could have afforded. It's, it's not good psychologically. And, you know, people like freedom. You know, given the choice, people like to get out, do things. Mobility is really useful. You may be able to start a business in due course because you've got some equity. You don't have that. And I think in my scheme, as I give you a theoretical situation where the person in question did acquire a place. He was funded 100% because instead of four and a half times lend, I think it was it six times, but whatever the figure was, he could get that property. Now, if he did the indemnity, in theory, he doesn't have to put money in, but let's say he does, he gets a slightly better rate on whatever the rate is. It you know, may have tiers up to 5%, this, 5 to 10x, a little bit more, that's the maximum. But I said, if in certain normal years, we're living in very turbulent times, I can see that. But say if the property prices went up 5% for five years, I think I proved that uh, I was able to prove that not only with the capital reductions, but with the value of appreciation of the asset, the person made on paper, on paper, you've got to sell it to realize it, £120,000 or no money in. That's better than the lottery. For no money in, mm. hundred. I'm not saying it's guaranteed. Things go up, things go down. But okay, you can say, well, it's had to be the the, the, um, the uh, indemnity fee. Fine, fine. But in general terms, we're talking about a win-win. The lender lends straight away to the people that you were talking about, not waiting five years. It's today, or you know, as soon as they buy it, bang. You've now got your independence, you've got your freedom, you've got possibilities, you're thinking what you can do. Sure, you've got mortgage, but you don't have a rent and uncertainty. And you're the master of your own destiny. I think that's pretty empowering. Very few people regret buying their home. But what I'm saying is put the foundations in a really good way. Make them strong. The lender can lend to you again later on. But let's get the key thing, which is first-time buyers are allowed to get on the market, and it's healthy for the market. People can move on and up, and people can buy from them in due course. Safe that they've got a portable, and I do stress portable mortgage. So if they see something next, they take that chunk. They may say to the lender, "Well, I've been a good lender for the past five years." Uh, I would like to have a loan on top of this. Maybe it's five year fix, whatever it is, and it adds on. Where's where's the where's the downside to the lender? The lender lends earlier, he gets a good credit rating uh, customer. They don't want to go elsewhere. You can actually have a good strong relationship with your bank, knowing that things aren't going to change. If you looked at my suggestion in 2019. If someone had taken the 20 year, I would imagine it would have been something, I don't, really don't know, 3.5%, something like that. Now, for two years, I think I saw on the paper, 6% is what's being started. You would think, right, I've got another 17 years at this rate, 
and I'm seeing crazy suggestions of six and seven percent base rate, and that in the margin that some of the lenders are charging would be eleven and a half percent. You're not going to cry in the evening that you're on three and a half percent, are you? It points to me a, a little bit of a fundamental problem in the way that we sort of lead on housing because we often hear that it takes years and years to save for a mortgage. Meanwhile, of course, the housing minister's priority is always targets to increase the housing supply. And uh, we've heard about all about this 300,000 new homes a year target since 2019, the Conservatives that they want to uh, to build. Um, research actually unveiled in uh, June this year um, suggested that the government was actually around about 120,000 homes short of meeting that target. So it just shows that setting arbitrary targets in that sense isn't going to work. But why is it that housing ministers, do you think, are actually prioritising new homes built as opposed to new first-time buyers on the market and certainly what age these first-time buyers are. Do you think that that would actually be a better measure for success? Yeah, I've said this before. The thing is, understand the rule of the minister. If you're the minister for agriculture and fisheries, you're not really going to devote a lot of time to aviation. But the thing is, you're going to take over a position from someone else. Now, if someone else is at 300,000, unless you come up and say, we would like to give less, it's not a very good prospect, is it? Mm. It's not a great vote winner. We're going to do less. So I could be wrong. Anyone can search. But I think I'm right in saying that approximately 1957, the last time we got to 300,000. So what's the point of having a target that you don't reach? Wouldn't it be better to say, let's recalibrate off the last three years and add on 10 or 20%. Let's have some targets that are meaningful, which would be good. And as I've said, you know, with, with that conversation, I would add, add into the equation, this person's looking at housing. Great. That's implying getting people in. Great. What about first-time buyers? You average out the, the first-time buyers for 10 years. That's your number. That's your baseline number. Now you should have, or I think, over the next five years, we would like to see a 10% increase each year. Now, Operation Mars, I get the impression it's over 500,000 people get rejected each year. Based on what you said, three and five years, think of the human cost of those people not getting on. It's crazy. And maybe they might not take jobs elsewhere because they can't get to the location. You put first-time buyers. How many have come in this year? Right. I would imagine the average age of a first-time buyer, every now you see it, seems to be going up. Is it 30, 34 to 36 years? Well, one of the next targets would be, let's see, within five years, it goes under 30 years of age. Why don't we have targets make sense to the person that's there out in the street trying to make a living, trying to get on and thinking at least there is a chance we're seeing things are going in the right direction, mm. not bewildering them and giving the despondency and, and taking away the possibility of ever getting on. They'll have to be thinking unless an aunt or an uncle goes or grandparent, it's almost impossible to get a place. Mm. So I'm offering people the possibilities of common sense and numeracy getting you what you want, when you want, and it doesn't bust the bank of mum and dad, the mad bank. It is crazy, but that is really one of the things to do. And by lending long, other countries do this, you underpin the property. It's like if you said a 20-year mortgage, think of foundations. You don't need 20-foot foundations, but a lot better than two years. That's a two-year to a two-foot foundation. Think of it in that term. You can sleep at night. You don't think, oh, gosh, I've got 16 months to go. I've got 12. I've got eight, seven. And you're looking at, wonder what the rate is, and you start panicking. You can sleep at night. You can get on with your life, and it's portable. Why has it not happened, Scott? 
I suppose what you can look at as well is there's a real lack of consistency on housing, isn't there? We've actually had, including the incumbent Marcus Jones, 12 housing ministers in the last 12 years and 21 housing ministers since 1997. So it's quite the hot seat, isn't it? And it almost seems as if we've kind of skewed the way that we measure success, but nobody is actually coming and sitting in and addressing it. It's very much sort of more of the same, isn't it? Well, as I say, it's a little bit of a poison chalice. I don't think that target has been reached for the period I've talked about. It was a different millennia. It was a different century that target was reached. I mean, if you were given a target that has like that, you'd be concerned that someone's given you it in the first place. And the fact that you've, there's no way you're going to get that target. And what are the consequences? You couldn't have 12 headmasters in a school every year it's changing. What, what would the local community think about their school? It would reflect badly on them. There would be some fundamental error. And you'd think, well, the Board of Governors may have lost the plot. There's something seriously going wrong, and we need to find that out. And the normal thing is you try and cure the or solve the problem. So, yeah, I think we've got a problem there. But I do think there should be something that's more tangible. If you did this poor, whoever takes it up, wouldn't it be great if they at least say the total number of housing is 210. The number of first-time buyers we've got on is now not whatever it was, but it's plus 500,000. We're doing a stunning job. It would make that person's job a whole lot easier. And great news to, for the populace. Fantastic. Before, the running average for the last five years or the last 10 years was, I don't know, 36.5 years. It's now 33. And we think we might get under 30 within the next 18, 24 months. Whether they do or not, it's neither here nor there. But it's still going in the right direction. I'd be a lot happier if I was sitting in that position thinking, you know, I've got options to at least say, well, we're doing a job that wasn't happening before. And the thing is, there are ideas out there for solutions that just need to be talked about. Mars is, of course, just one of them, even if that isn't necessarily the solution that eventually we go for. If we do find one, it's going to start some sort of conversation and the, the discussion needs to be had. And essentially, that's what we're all about here. And there's a real sense of urgency about this as well, isn't there? Because um, obviously, the more people that get onto the property ladder, the more people are more than likely moving out of rented accommodation. And at a time where we're seeing landlords scurrying because they can't get out of the market quick enough due to current conditions, that creates, as I've said, a real sense of urgency, doesn't it? Because the rental market, there's there's quite the uh, the perilous situation there too, isn't there? Well. Uh, people are, are trapped. It's no different. Uh, the, the, the tenants and the landlords are trapped, to be honest. No, 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 it's not just landlords. Think of people that uh, have pubs. Think of people that have hotels and the hospitality industry. Everyone is a sitting target. Residential owners are a sitting target. But to put things in perspective, I've seen this over the years, really. I mean, we had a Titanic moment last week. And everyone's panicked. And, oh, the rate's going to be this and the rate's going to that. I would say, just calm down. <laughs> There's worse things. We It's early days. But quite honestly, this happened in Britain because, obviously, there was a change of prime minister. And there was a competition, who will be the next prime minister? And then, obviously, when someone comes in, they're going to say, well, what are you going to do that's different? Or you said this, so let's hear it. Now, if this had been in America, you've got, say, you've got sterling is quite an important currency. The euro is an important currency, but it's a federal uh, system. Various countries join together and they have a concept of what the taxation is. So if someone were to to leave, it doesn't mean that the the rules change. But in America, say, Mr. Biden, whatever happened, in theory, it's a similar situation to bring everyone would be focused on the new incumbent. Well, what are you going to do? And I suspect, rightly or wrongly, it would be very unusual for everyone to say, oh, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, unless they're giving away money all the time, but people would say, 
well, how do, and, you know, can we afford it? Does it work? There would always be naysayers, and that's what's happened here. There's been disruption to the market. I would like to think we've had our earthquake moment, and things will calm down. And it has to calm down, because the numbers won't sadly work. What are the problems that we're seeing in the rental market at the moment? Utilities price hikes is one thing that is causing a huge amount of distress, but there's also the prospect of potential rent controls that are being talked about. And already that's going to create a massive disparity, isn't it? And probably only going to force more people out because if you essentially cap the amount that a landlord can bring in in rent, yet costs elsewhere are going up, it's a no-brainer that they're going to have to sell up leave the market and perhaps even look at losing their own house? Well, they would. I, have had, I know two people, one was in tears, another one saying, I just can't take this. And also the problem for one of them, this will trigger capital gains. They weren't planning for capital gains at this stage, but they will actually be pushed into it. And they may have to sell the primary residence. It, these things can have a really big knock-on effect. Now, Rent controls have appeared here and there. Uh, the one that most recent, I think, was in Berlin, and it was actually seen as non-constitutional. Now, what I, I gather, they've done up in Scotland. Okay, right. We're not allowing people to go out. And, and, and to be honest, I, I can understand there's a human aspect to this, and no one's going to be up in uproar unless you actually own the property yourself, and I'll explain that shortly. But in a way, it makes sense. Who wants to be, shall we say, made theoretically homeless, uh, and especially at a cold time of the year? There was legislation passed in France in the 60s because they had a bitter winter. I think it was 62. And it was a monk. Uh, his name was, what is it? Uh, Abbey Pear. And he became a national mm-hmm. saint, effectively. But he, 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 there was a law passed, which basically is law, to prevent people being made homeless at that time of year. People are freezing to death in the streets. So I can see that. But let, let's have a look at what's been proposed. Oh, we don't really think they should charge more. Great, fine. Here's a situation that they forgot. So now this was done before all these mega thoughts about the, the utilities going up. And of course, what happened last week and the, the prospect of doubling the, uh, the mortgage. So what I would say. Just to balance it, if you're going to say that to landlords, why don't you say, and the lenders who are lending to those landlords cannot increase the cost of borrowing during that time, nor can the utility cost per unit increase during that time. That would be fair, wouldn't it? Well, otherwise, you're going to have a huge disparity, aren't you? Because landlords simply are going to be capped what they can have coming in they aren't going to be able to afford what's going out and that's going to force not just them to obviously give up the property but whoever is the tenant is going to be losing a roof over their head as well um however i think there might be a little bit of demonization of landlords in the media and not too much consideration of those circumstances no, it's, a, it's a better story it pulls out yeah. two pages keeps getting going but have a listen to this imagine you've got um, a building it's three levels the, the expenses could be a water level, if you wish. But the expenses for, you know, on your mortgage, the, the person that owns it and is letting to a family, let's say there's five people. So those costs will get to probably around the top of the, uh, the first floor, so two levels up. Now, imagine if you've come off a rate which was, let's say, is a five-year fix. So it's, it's, it was something like three and a half, and now it's going to be six and a half. How far up that building will that take you with your costs? It's probably going to be in and around, right to the roof. Then, if you're thinking that your utilities and you're paying for them, and it can be in many cases, those will go up 10 or 20%. That would be a lot. Forget that and think 300 or 400%. You've gone right over the top of this property. You cannot continue to hold the property for long. You are then subsidizing it. So you're becoming the social services. And to do that, you'll deplete whatever monies you have 
you may have to sell your own home or other places. And the thing that's very easy to overlook is you're passing a tremendously powerful message to people, do not be a landlord. So how do the people that eventually get moved on because the bank forecloses, where do they go? And at what price? Would you take a lower price job, the one that you take, you got? I mean, if you want a different way of looking at it, imagine if, if um, people said, I want to leave a job because I can't cover all my, my mortgage and utilities and I've been offered 20% more. Imagine if, land, uh, if uh, employers said, no, you, you're not allowed to leave. There, there's an employment freeze. I know MPs aren't going to do that. You know they aren't going to do that. It'd be, it would be disastrous to go by the end of the week. But what's the difference? You're restricting the person's choice with one, but not on the other. And as I say, you're saying, oh, we're not going to do this. Great. Well, just don't allow the landlord to go bust. Let's ride it out together. Put a freeze on the landlord's um, mortgage or uh, loan interest for the period of the time that this freeze is going to be, and the utilities, or you subsidize them. It doesn't matter. You want to keep five, seven people in. There may be no option. They will be going because the, the, the lender may have to foreclose. That's it. No one wins. And also, you've passed a terrible, terrible message to everyone. You've got rid of people who were already in the market. Who's going to replace them after they've seen the experienced people or semi-experienced people have, have gone? And at what cost would your, will the accommodation be thereafter? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Mm. <laughs> That's what would happen. Do we think the fact that this isn't being thought about and talked about enough is because that there is this sort of demonization and witch hunt against landlords? Landlords are seen as the bad guys. And if you were even, and I think we've discussed this on the uh, the previous podcast that we did together, if you were to change the tag landlord to home provider, which is essentially yep. what they are, would the reaction be anywhere near as vociferous? Yeah, I do. well, what would happen is you... You could have this discussion and say, look, home providers, da, 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 do we need them? They would say yes. And then you would say, because they're giving a service and they deserve to be fine. You're talking about housing, social, da, 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 da. Once someone realizes you're talking about a landlord, they'll, they'll be okay until you say landlord. Oh, hold on, hold on. And then it's becoming Dickensian. It's uh, Victorian or the streets and dark places and greediness. Never hear the word greedy with other. Uh, you know, greedy doctors, greedy whatever, but it's an association. You never hear the word benevolent, do you? It's it's almost a um, conditioned response. So we've got to think in a way that if you cannot buy a place, there is a real need for putting roofs over people's heads. There's good, bad, and indifferent in all society. Not perfect, and I'm, quite a lot of the regulation is quite tough, but it makes perfect sense to me. You know, it, 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 it's fine. But we've got to be able to have a service. It's almost as if there's a uh, an enemy of the state that's triggered a reaction. <laughs> it's got, got the British government or the parties to say, well, we're going to take this tough stance. Well, I would say the Finance Act triggered something that they couldn't have foreseen the future. Let's face it, it was a time when they were saying, you know, uh, if Brexit won't happen. I'm not saying right or wrong, but something did happen, yeah? But they, they hadn't figured that. So maybe they hadn't figured about residential letting, yeah? And then COVID came, and that has changed everything. I asked you to investigate it. You, you found out that really no estate agents knew what I talked about. Mm. But once, they, once you disclosed it to them, wasn't it like it's a, a light bulb moment? And that was 18 million spare rooms pre-COVID locked out. After, half had vanished. Is that not why rents rose? Because people needed to come back. They had their place, wherever it was, that they needed for working two days a week or one day a week at 
at, at this location and three or four days at the near the office location. And so there's this huge demand, and that's what flooded in. Nine million vanished, and I would suggest that a high proportion of the residual is with people who are over, say, 50s and, and or through to the really elderly. They cannot or they won't be uh, assisting people week in, week out. They'll just have visitors, etc., and whatever. But that's the problem. So you've got that. You've had COVID. You've had Brexit. You did a U-turn yesterday. The government did a U-turn yesterday. Mm. Here's another one. I, I, I haven't a clue how many U-turns. Why haven't the U-turned on something as fundamental as a roof over a person or a family's head? Begs the question, doesn't it? Mm, indeed, it does, and what? that's not even obviously. In, in, even if you don't look at something like Mars, what you have to do is you've got to enable more places to come onto the market for mm-hmm. rent because greater supply is going to give a greater amount of choice and rents are going to come yeah. down. And it, it's a simple equation, isn't it? Um, and the, the conditions um, just aren't there, are they? Well, last person, do you want a roof over your head? Yes or no? No. Well, where do you live? Oh, well, you've got a roof over your head. You're not living out in the open ground or fields, are you? So, right, so you want a roof over your head. You want it for your, your, your wife and your family? Yes, great. Are you finding it difficult to find place? Yes. Would you like more choice? I'm not going to say no. Would you like the more choice at a lower cost to you? I mean, there's not much point in having an education if you can't answer those in in ways that make logical sense. And it also is positive for your pocket. More choice means also the standard of the property has to be competitive. If you've got 10 properties, you've got a range. If you've only got one, it's... it's, uh, you, you're stuff. You're going to compete with probably 10 people. And who's going to blame you with rising bills if someone says, look, it's easier for me to survive. I can't help it. What would you do in my shoes? And people would say, yeah, kind of. You know, the, the rules were switched. You really expect someone just because they have a name on a property that they should be treated differently to you when you put yourself in that position. You concede, actually, it's right need variety. Variety is the spice of life. What about property? Could it be the spice for property? Choice is needed. And there's vanilla. When I joined banking late 90s, when I went in, I was catching my head. You've got one product. And I remember saying to someone, I wrote up to the um, the relevant department, saying, surely we've got to have a range of products. You've, you've, you're effectively saying, you know, at that time, You've got a product, one product fits all, the tea boy and the chairman. And they were flummoxed. At one stage, we had this horrendous uh, recession where interest rates went 75 to 15%, and people were handing back the keys. And the only way people could protect themselves, and again, this comes to operation mark and margins and all the rest, is that you could only get a two year fixture. A two-year fixture. I mean, we could do open-heart surgery. We could send ballistic missiles halfway around the world. We put satellites into space. And the best thing in the banking, you get two years. And that's it. I mean, how deficient is that? The thinking on that. I mean, really, you know, to, to solve the thing, we've seen some amazing things. We've seen Steve Jobs bringing out the uh, iPhone that's transformed everything. That's basically the world in you, the palm of your hand. We've seen Elon Musk literally, you know, putting uh, satellites on the space, going things, launching a car into space, and then thinking going to Mars. I mean, and we can't sort these situations out. But that thing was doubling in the space of about a year, and it was traumatic. So I'm suggesting we have to have a better way of thinking that people don't get shaken out. If it was a 30-year deal, fine. You can you can bolt onto, it, but at least you're safe day one, and you'll be a lot safer as the youth, succeeding youth go by. So we have to have a different way of thinking about how loans are structured in this country, and what we want for succeeding generations. Because I think I'm right in saying that the generation after the boomers are going potentially may have a shorter lifespan than those 
in, in front of them. That's the thing about the first time in history. Let's give them some good news. We've given them a backpack of debt coming out of universities, colleges, you name it, and then say, be positive, get a job, and then try and get a property. Really? But in the meantime, rent. Something has to change. People can solve problems only if they wish to. That's it, isn't it? It's just how much we actually want the solution or whether we're just going to file it in the, the too difficult box. And we've got to be looking at the uh, the, the former. Um, just looking at something as well that you sort of brought up in 2019, as we've alluded to, um, you sort of wrote in the uh, the Parliamentary Review publication about first-time buyers being allowed higher income multiples with fixed rate mortgages from, say, 20 years plus. And in view of this, it's actually looking unbelievably sensible, isn't it? Because a 10-year fixed rate mortgage at the time could have cost anything from, say, sort of 2.5% to 3.75% interest. But you're probably not going to be able to get a two- or three-year deal for anything under 4% at the moment. But who'd actually have a problem? Say they got a 20-year loan with rates being lower – if they've got sort of a 17 years or so to go on that at around 3.5%, there'd be, there'd be no anxiety, would there? Well, I know that if there was an MP in front of me and I gave them a choice for their sons or daughters, grandchildren, which one they would take. They say, well, what, they've got to have the really rocky road, do they? And, and they may have to ask you for a substantial amount for the deposit when it's not necessary. How do you feel about that? Are you happy about it? Are you willing to do it when it's technically not necessary. I don't think there'd be many people who say, no, nah, I'd rather just, just go along with what was there before. A little, a little bit like um, steps. I'm sure if you won the, the clock back thousands of years, who was the first one person that went up the hill? They were probably clambering up the hill. But someone would probably said, you know what, if, if you step on things like those rocks there, you could maybe do something that you can get up without having to, to use all fours. So steps come in and they get washed away in the rate. But eventually, let's use rocks. So we get a path and we go up that. So that continues. And then people cut stones and pyramids, etc. And we have them in houses. Wow, the joys of steps. When you go up turrets, joys of steps. At some stage, the height of the property increases. And then you look at New York. Someone decided, you know what, we could put in a lift. And I think it was Otis, put a lift. And you could go up 100 stories. And you didn't have to walk up 100 stories. But had he not been around, would people still be walking up steps? No one thought about it. Then someone probably thought, you know what, rather than going vertically, we could do something up to maybe 30 degrees, perhaps a little bit more. It's called an escalator. Wow. What would we do without those things? So we've accepted things, but is there better? I'm only putting forward something that you seem to buy into, and you've market researched it in a very small scale. But here's a question. If there are MPs out there, are you brave enough to to change things, go from steps? And my suggestion, trial it. That's what you do with most things. You trial it. And you see the results. And if they look good, well, guess what? You decide what you want to do thereafter. But you get nothing for doing nothing. It's when you do something, you may be rewarded. What is the downside? And think of the human cost for people who are viable being given, given the same that went before, went before. Time for a change. It is, isn't it? Because if we don't look to help first time buyers in this way or a way similar to this and we don't do anything to reform the private rental market, it's only going to get worse, isn't it? Supply is going to fall off a cliff given the current situation and everyone is going to be so much worse off for it. Um, And there's evidence as well. We talked about utilities, but landlords are also having to in the private market uh, foot incredible sort of uh, maintenance and repair bills, aren't they? And there's also the um, sort of compliance with um, environmental regulations as well so to retrofit existing properties to sort of yeah. get them to a point where they're sustainable enough to sort of meet the uh, the net zero agenda that's going to be even more of a cost isn't it and with rising utilities bills and these costs and the prospect of again trying to sort of cap what rent can come in it's the whole thing yeah. is going to fall flat on its face well i've got something beside me to be honest uh, it was a 
property uh, section, or one of the papers, I won't say, but at the top it says, why London will be hardest hit. Why? It's not hard. The yields are lowest. It's understandable. The favorite city in the world. Why London will be hardest hit. You you saw Her Majesty's funeral. 5.1 billion people saw that. I wonder if a small percentage would say, you know what? They can put on a show those British people. I'd love to go to London and see the the the, the countries within a country called Great Britain or the United Kingdom. Well, they're going to find difficulty getting a place to rent. But the hotels will be fine. We should max out the tourism. But here, another section is it says. Well, the secret landlord. The heading is why it's now time to sell up, and that's an experienced person that's been in year after year, and it is the costs are mounting. It's not as if we're in a boom economy where money is really cheap. No, money is, is rare as hen's teeth, and you can see what's coming up in twenty twenty five. You're going to have to get a C category. Uh, for an energy, energy performance certificate. If you don't, you ain't going to be uh, renting that property out. So that's one less in the market than when you need it. So maybe six people won't be, five people may not be given a chance at the first place in, in London. It could be doctors, nurses, engineers. Mm-mm, you're not going to get it. So there's a lot of Victorian stock in London. So, you know, if you're lucky to have something like that, and it costs you 10000 or more, maybe even higher, to retrofit it or in some way, not to damage the exterior, but to make it. And I understand it, it makes good sense. But boy, I think most people come 2025 will be struggling. It's just the way it is. Half the landlords, I have to advise one or two people that are friends, because they'd never, they, they never joined the Landlords Association, really behind the curve. Um, I've supplied them with uh, tenants, so that's fine. But if, if myself or my colleagues weren't there to guide them, they could have someone stays in, leaves after 2025, and they're unbeknown to them, they haven't done the necessary, and all of a sudden, there might be five grand, ten grand to add on top, and in the meantime, you're getting no rent. Surprise, surprise. So I could be wrong, but I think it'll get delayed for a little while. You know, we're having such an amazing series of mm, demands, etc. And I can see the government's position, you know, when, when, when. But you may have to put it down to 2028 or, or 30 to give people enough breathing space. In one development, long story, a nice lady there. She's retired. She's going to have to pay fifteen thousand, so it's two or three hundred for sort of general work. It's not even a roof replacement. It's general work on in and around the roof, but it's not a replacement and masonry work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It requires scaffolding on two blocks. If you retired, fifteen grand's a lot of money. Mm. Not home, but if you've got other places, it's kind of you can understand why it's now time to sell up. That's the article. Yes, it appeared in the uh, the Telegraph, didn't it? The Sunday Telegraph, and it was a double page feature. Who would want to be a landlord? Very recently, and I think that's going to it's resonating with a lot of people, isn't it? And understandably so, given what we talked about. Well, the front page on that, you're quite right. I didn't want to advertise that mortgage chaos triggers property market fall, and you can see a house going through a black hole on the inside. It's it's you still see it from underneath. Them. So there are huge problems. Let's not just think the landlords just have a, a money tree they just go to and print the money and it's all good. We're just normal human beings. Some people, are, it's the auntie's old house and they thought, oh, I've got it, I'll just rent it out. But that'll go. And then, you know, maybe they took a mortgage for whatever reason, helping uh, other relatives. And then if they go, they'll get capital gains. And, well, I didn't realize this. And there's potential catastrophe around each corner. They really should be thinking. How many U-turns? And is this in national interest? If it's not, well, it seems that they're doing a good job. It doesn't seem as if it's particularly important. And then in Scotland, as I say, fine, cap out. Cap out the, the lender. They won't be happy. Why should, uh, why should someone be the recipient of all the bad news? Utilities, cap them out. If you're going to freeze it, freeze everything. Don't freeze one person, freeze it all lot. Where's the joined up thinking? Mm. 
And that's the problem, isn't it? It's with it's the fact that we're focusing on the one thing rather than focusing on the whole package as a whole. And then there's always going to be that inevitable imbalance. And it just seems as if there's a real lack of consideration there. So what we need to see really is people actually sitting down and looking at the bigger picture in the longer run and actually looking at something either to increase the supply in the private rental market or just do something to help first-time buyers get on the ladder and try and reduce the demand that way. Either way, something has to give, doesn't it? Yeah, the elastic can't keep stretching. How, how, how does it work? <laughs> oh, seriously. <laughs> there was a law passed which said we must empower tenants who you may or may not know, who may not be earning money, to receive money and they decide effectively like you they will get your salary and they will return it to you after they receive it that got passed through through um the house of commons got the royal assent i mean have you ever heard of something more ludicrous than your salary or paycheck goes to someone persons known or unknown with the expectation that they pay the rent yeah and that's it. You know, you're effectively saying, there's the paycheck, you have it, but you must return it. So there was a catalogue of catastrophes. They even trialled it. It was, a, sadly, the, the news was, let's be honest, it wasn't exactly favourable, but they still brought it out. I mean, how much of this is really common sense and just poor thinking? Food for thought for any MP that might be tuning into this for certain. And um, here's just another little statistic as well, just to uh, kind of throw in there. And uh, it isn't directly um, sort of associated with sort of landlords per se, but it is just an idea of what they're up against. So let's say landlords can't adjust rent to essentially amount for higher prices, but let's say that somebody who owned a pub could do that. So given the energy that um, uh, your typical pub is going to, uh, to consume at the moment, if they adjusted prices, is to account for the increase in price of wholesale energy, a pint would cost twenty five pounds. Yeah, but I saw that. A landlord can't yeah. increase them, um, obviously, uh, the rent because, like I say, I mean, I know, I know, there's obviously the whole ethical arguments around increasing rent during a cost of living crisis, but they have got margins that they have to stick to. So, if you're going to freeze one thing, you've got to essentially freeze across the board, haven't you? Because something is going to give otherwise. Yeah, no. Look, we we are on a boat. The uh, good ship GB. And it's going to affect everyone. But we have to have some better thinking and longer term thinking, unless if we get to next year. I mean, maybe in future, you're allowed to have an agreement with an energy source and you're allowed, or, or there is a deal, that energy suppliers must give you a minimum of five year deal. And it could be, yeah, well, they'll increase by two or three percent or in- inflation linked. Have you heard that in the paper? No, I, I haven't seen that. Well, no, because everything's gone crazy. At some stage, we've got to have things where people can plan their existence. And it's just not happening. Each year, I look, oh, there's more first-time buyers that are not going to be helped. And that property ladder has to be fit and healthy. And here's a question for you. In the great, we've got the housing minister doing things. We've got to get more people to go. It's really good and the, the stamp duty has been adjusted. That's great. Mm. That's fine. Here's the question I'm going to ask you. Why should the person that's got least money pay the stamp duty? It's got to be paid. Mm. Why should it be the purchaser? And the answer is, because it always happens. Steps, escalators, lifts. My suggestion could be, the person that's got the largest capital, probably older and etc. people that are selling perhaps won't like this, but if you forewarn people, like the finance act, what's coming down the track, there's some merit in what they said, but it was an atrocious scheme, and which no other country has in effect, which is unbelievable. You know, well done, gold star for that. So what I'm saying is, three years advance notice, 
when you buy your place, you'll pay 95% of the stamp duty for whatever it is. The seller, 5%. The following year, 10 and 90. Now, 15, 85, until it becomes 50, 50. Wouldn't that be good? Because it's less painful on the purchaser that wants to go up and the seller needs someone to come up to buy them. So why is it stamp duty is paid solely and only by the purchaser? Which scheme would you prefer? I think you've got uh, there's got to be some acknowledgement, hasn't there, that both parties are benefiting from the sale. So it does make a question, doesn't it? Given that you're getting a huge return in terms of the, the person selling it is going to get a significant return in terms of getting the money for the property anyway. I mean, why on earth would they not want to, of course, put a bigger stamp duty contribution down when they've, of course, got more money coming into their pocket? But you, you did beg the question. Why? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I've never seen it. And people say, oh, that's ridiculous. But that's called vested interest. Mm. There is one problem in the chain. It's the person right at the top, the person that's got the big house that's, you know, elderly, whatever. Now, if it was seen that that person traded down and maybe it was into a care home, then they might be given an incentive to do that, which is the first X period. Maybe there's a 20,000 lump sum, et cetera. So there's an incentive for them to think, well, you know, you'll be carrying your, your sale proceeds, but also there's a contribution. There should be enough in itself, but so they don't feel completely hard done by. But if it's generally and they move in, then the funding goes. So there, or there's lack of a reduction or whatever. There's some benefit. There's an incentivization. It, economics is all about incentives. And so what I'm saying is to free up the market, I've told you what the position is, the government still gets their full stamp duty. Ray, well done for that. They may spend it on overspend on HS2 and all other things, etc. but they've got the money that they want. It's a different way of achieving it, but it allows you to think we can afford it, whereas if it was 100%, maybe we couldn't on the stamp duty. Possibilities, incentives, let's think differently. There's nothing I'm seeing that isn't vanilla. And if you go into an ice cream shop, one that's still in existence, they don't just sell vanilla. Food for thought, isn't it? For anybody tuning into this. What like you've got to look at you've got to look at the bigger picture, haven't you? You've got to look at the incentives and you think about it, there are many ways in which this could benefit all parties and I've got to say, Alistair, I mean, it's been thought provoking um, and certainly um, eye opening as ever welcoming you onto the show. And it is a real shame that we're just about out of time on today's programme because I'd love to work to continue this uh, discussion. And I think certainly there'll be room to do so again in the uh, in the future. Um, Just before we do wrap things up, um, obviously, looking at the uh, the current economic situation, um, we've seen so, so many U-turns. But I suppose we're just left sort of waiting in the lurch, hoping that, you know, MPs do cotton on to this and, you know, we do actually sort of feel the real urgency of going and looking at these problems, looking at the bigger picture and actually going about real solutions, solving them, take things forward and take the initiative rather than just being reactive to all of these circumstances. Yeah, take steps. But think of what I said about steps. Steps can be improved upon. It only just takes the ability to put one foot beyond the other then you get momentum. This is solvable. So let's put minds and bodies together and do something that makes foundations safe for people in the first rung of the ladder, and then they can springboard thereafter. It'll be healthier. It gives people hope. It gives people possibilities. It prevents people being depressed about a future that won't arrive. What's the downside? Plenty of upsides. So let's get up and start doing strong message strong message indeed and one that those in government would certainly do well to heed 
I'm Alistair Kerr, founding director of Acre Properties Limited in West London. Thanks ever so much for taking the time to join us on the show once again. And I hope that everybody tuning into the program thoroughly enjoyed today's interview. Um, I've been your host, Scott Chaloner, as usual, on the Leaders Council podcast. And do remember as well that if any of these issues we've discussed on today's episode do particularly resonate with you, you can leave a comment with us here at the Leaders Council by visiting leaderscouncil, all one word, dot co dot uk forward slash contact hyphen us um, or alternatively if you have your own perspective to add to the discussion or want to bring your own topical matter or issue to the discussion table you can apply to be on our program to share your views with us via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply uh, until next time do take care all and goodbye and we will see you all again very soon <laughs>